Hello, I'm Thomas Hare, Chief Content Officer of the Performance Driven Marketing Institute, a not-for-profit trade association that serves companies in the performance and direct-to-consumer marketing world. Welcome to the second event in our 2024 Spring Seminar Series, today created by the E-Commerce Council. Hot potato, 10 things performance and e-commerce leaders are excited about. We welcome all of you to today's event, PDMI members and non-members alike. If you're not a member but are attending today, we'd love to have you consider joining the association. There's no better way to support the mission of the PDMI than joining and sharing your voice in the direction of the industry. In the handouts tab of your control panel, you'll find our PDMI membership brochure. I urge you to download it, flip through it, and contact any team members should you desire more information. One more housekeeping note, the group will be addressing any questions from the audience at the end of today's session, but you don't have to wait to ask them. Utilize the questions tab on your control panel to type and send your question in. We'll be collecting them and we'll try to get to as many as possible in the final moments of the webinar. You know, no, though navigating the e-commerce landscape can be tricky for performance marketers and their agency and vendor partners, opportunities to find success continue to abound. New technologies, emerging outlets, and other areas of growth are consistently arriving. And these experts from the PDMI's seven member councils are here to share the things they're most passionate about in the industry right now. Where can performance marketing go next? Let's find out. First up, we're thrilled to welcome Fern Lee. She's the CEO of Thor Associates, chair of the PDMI Women's Leadership Council and a member of the e-commerce council. Thanks as always, Fern, for joining us. Take it away. Thanks. So I get to lead off. So as we all know, what is old is new again in today's marketing world. So I'm here to tell you that linear TV is not dead. Okay, stop rolling your eyes, everyone out there, because I'm going to show you connecting the dots to integrating brands and linear, linear TV and how important this is. So as we all know, commercials still play a very important role in the marketing plan. From high-end products, home goods, air purifiers, Christmas trees, hearing aids, insurance, and especially this year, the politicals. So the strength of frequency is key and linear TV reaches the masses delivering the halo for digital. So I'm gonna talk a little about integrations because it's such an important part of linear TV and most people don't even know what an integration is. They don't understand how it's used, but it is so prevalent in building brands. So linear TV integrations support brands to share voice and consumer education by utilizing paid sponsorship with a scripted inclusion to a storyline or talk show segment. We utilize syndicated research to identify the most appropriate shows to reach the target audience. So if you have a client who is home goods, Christmas trees, Hallmark movies are a phenomenal way to build brand, okay? Then when we look at insurance, and especially Medicare Advantage, and how valuable and the commodity is from October 15th to December 7th, we've done many, many, many integrations with people like Dr. Phil, Sherry Shepard, Tamron Hall, CBS, ABC, NBC, and they're usually five minute outlets. It's all about educating the consumer and then having them understand benefits, dialing an 800 number, it's very, very key. So again, education with integrations deliver actual benefit information with compelling, timely, and relevant value. So identifying a spokesperson brings credibility to brands so the consumer trusts the brands and leads to purchase. So one of our clients, Colonial Pen, we use Jonathan Lawson. He also does their commercials. He is their new Alex Trebek. And every time that we're on an integration, people scream from the audience for him because they love and adore him. So integrations also allow for personalization of content. The networks drive viewership by posting on social media. So again, we're looking at the halo effect. ROI is being defined as building brand recognition and leveraging all creative assets in an omni-channel strategy. And then last but not least, traditional tenants still provide powerful results as DRTV brand response rests its laurels on recognition through education, experience, and entertainment. Integrations have added to this tenant. That's my hot potato, my start. Love it, Fern. Thank you. And what's, you know, truly what's old can be new, right? And we can Absolutely. find ways to, to make that make that work and, and continue to make it work. Interesting lead off uh, considering where we're going. And, and you know, I will say that I'm the only person on this uh, call that knows exactly where we're headed through this this map. Um, I have all 10 uh, topics in front of me, but nobody else on the call knows what the others are going to talk about. So up next, we're going to pass the hot potato to Sarah Lavoie, partner at Baker Hosteller, a member of our Government Affairs and Brand Response Council. Sarah, thank you for joining us. 
Thank you. Um, so Fern, I couldn't agree more. What's old is new again, and that is true for my topic, something I'm really excited about in e-commerce. It's retail media networks. All sorts of our clients are coming to us asking how to place media on a retail media network or how to stand one up and set up the terms and conditions and the best processes. So what is a retail media network? It really is um, an emerging and somewhat established in certain places um, publishing outlet. Right, so retailers are taking advantage of their shopper base. People show up at a retailer ready to shop. So what retailers have done is look at that value and say, hey, we can become publishers ourselves. Let's sell ad space. So that's really the what. Retailers are leveraging that digital media space as well as some other places, which I'll tell you about. Um, and they're selling ads to those retailers who sell within their stores now, um, but they will also open up the ad inventory to others if you're not in a big retailer, but you have a product and you wanna reach those same types of customers. All right, um, when did this start happening? It started in 2011 with the big guys, we all know Amazon, Walmart, and others, but more and more are getting in on the game. Um, some that you might not expect that have retail media networks, T-Mobile, Chase Bank, Saks has opened up a luxury retail media network. In addition to Walgreens, Target, they're really sophisticated. Deloitte said that 64% uh, 64, 64 of retailers plan to implement a retail media network by the end of 2024. Um, it's not just their digital media properties. It is apps, it is websites, um, but it also can be direct mail, in-store, and again, back to what's old is new again, it's those end caps. Remember, advertisers used to pay for that? <laughs> They'll pay for it again, um, both online and in-store. All right. Um, why do retailers do this? It's obvious they're leveraging their, their shoppers, that first-party data to create a whole new revenue stream, and it's working really well. Also, the reason advertisers love it, because people show up ready to buy. They are primed and ready to go. That's why they're there to shop. And also uh, retailers can create more and more inventory, right? They can always sell more ads in different ways. Um, how they're doing this. They are using digital media terms that we've seen before, IAB 3.0, or they will use a bespoke set of terms that are simpler and easy to activate. Um, the important thing that we advise our clients is to try to tie that those media terms to sales or something actionable within a retail media network. It's a nice, unique opportunity. All right. And to cap it off, I was intrigued by the media spend. The ANA, the Association of National Advertisers, projects that retail media spend will hit $61 billion globally soon. So one in five digital ad dollars spent by marketers will go to retail media networks. And that's my hot potato. <laughs> that is true. I mean, I'm glad you got to that last number. That that stat is what popped to my mind when you sent in this topic. Um, and the projection showing that there's a possibility of retail media network spend out uh, outpacing uh, television ad spend over the next three to five years, possibly. It's a huge opportunity. So thank you, Sarah. Appreciate it. Um, our next volunteer is Marianne Batista, founder of Batista Direct Marketing and a member of the Women's Leadership Council. Marianne. Hello, everyone. So my uh, hot potato item is watching the trends in consumer behavior in search. So things are changing like crazy, as I think we all know on every front. But one of the trends that we have identified, and I think many of you are aware of this one, I'm gonna just go through some trends and tell you how I think it impacts your business. And that is double screening. So double screening is the phenomenon of um, consumers sitting in front of their TVs with another device, TV, tablet, computer. And what that avails them of, of course, is the ability to search on any manner of subject that pops into their mind or onto their screen. So they are searching about questions and, and comments that come up about ads that they see, your ads. And you need to be prepared, obviously, to be able to be discoverable for that. Um, a large percent of the population has begun to search exclusively within YouTube. 
And that's where that's where we come in. We help people to get their content discoverable in YouTube. Um, there are five billion active monthly users in the world who are on YouTube, and within the United States, that number is about 244 million. So they're there. Your consumer is there without question. And I often get asked, well, is my actual target there? And the answer is yes. Between the ages of 15 and 55, the rates are 70% and up of internet users. So that's a huge number. And then slightly less, but just slightly, for 56 and over. 67% of 56 year old and over internet users are around YouTube. So they're all there, we're all there, and businesses who are, who are well positioned are gonna take advantage of that. So what is the bottom line? The bottom line really is that you need to be discoverable within YouTube for your branded as well as your non-branded keywords. Um, a well-optimized YouTube account will also, as a side benefit, get you ranking within Google search for those that go to Google first, and some still do, of course. Um, you want to have your listing for your, for your um, video come up in organic in that ranking. So a couple more quick trends. I think I might be winding down on my time. Um, there is a massive consumer preference for organic overpaid uh, search results. There are all kinds of statistics and study out, studies out there that show that when a video is offered up as a solution to their problem, they will click on the video, video far and above clicking on a written response. And basically the bottom line is people are lazy and they really enjoy watching videos. Um, and then we have another that there is a massive preference for organic over paid search returns. So the consumer has gotten savvier and savvier, and they really get the difference between the sponsored stuff at the top and then the, uh, the, the organic or earned stuff that comes up underneath that. And so if you want your video content to come up high in that organic search panel as high as you can possibly get it. We usually can get it to on page one within number one or two or three. Um, in order to capture that traffic. So not only are people advertising, are advertisers advertising, and then, and then the leakage that they get over to YouTube goes to the best, most optimized advertiser or business. Um, but additionally, you have AI coming into play, and that is really massively changing what's gonna be happening with regular on-page SEO. Um, in YouTube, uh, there is a uh, disclaimer that must be placed on all AI generated content. We still really believe that people like to talk to and see people and prefer that over AI generated content, even though frankly, it's getting really good. I saw something on over the weekend that blew me away. But at the end of the day in YouTube, if you are not disclaiming that you are using AI, um, you can get that video taken down and ultimately even your um, channel taken down. So, and that's different in YouTube. So you can kind of control that, which is great. So I think that's about where I want to wrap. That's my hot potato. We're watching the consumer behaviors and trends in search, and we're seeing that all directions point to YouTube. Yep. Thank you, Marianne. We, uh, we are a very active YouTube household here uh, from age three to age 53. Yeah. Um, <laughs> YouTube, uh, might even think the PDMI's uh, YouTube channel is searching for uh, Paw Patrol based on uh, based on who's using the system at any given time. So great stuff, though. Right. Lots of lots of insights and great uh, great uh, add on there about AI and how you have to you have to um, let everyone know whether or not you're using AI. I've noticed that pop up over the last few months when creating our YouTube videos. So um, great stuff. And a great lead into Greg Sarnow, founder of Allegro Response and the Direct Response Academy, as well as co-chair of the PDMI University Council and a member of our U.S. Hispanic Council. Greg, I think you are going to pick up that AI baton and run with it a little bit. No, you're on mute, Greg. Yeah, there's always got to be one person who doesn't know to turn the mute off. Um, <laughs> yes, I certainly am going to take a few minutes to talk about AI because no matter what part of our business you're in, AI is having an impact throughout our entire industry and, and so much in the direct-to-consumer space. 
I particularly uh, live in the space of a, of a call center, and um, it's hardly a hardly can use the word call center anymore. But um, AI has had an incredible effect there, especially as it relates to the customer experience. Customer experience is really something that is, I mean, next to the promise of a product, customer service is the most important thing in building brand. Um, just to give you an idea, when TriStar sold its, um, you know, its cookware brand to Spectrum Brands, when you saw the, um, the PR piece that was put out on that, Spectrum Brands described itself as an innovative company that had great customer service. And so AI is having an incredible impact on customer service. And you know that's something that I wanted to take a minute to talk about because for all of us in, in building, who are responsible for building brands, that customer experience that is created is impacted more by AI than many things out there now because it's already happening. Um, I guess, you know, to, to really start that, we start with um, training agents and everything to deal with knowledge bases and how they're being um, optimized, everything to do with, um, you know, having an agent assist there where an agent who might not know the answer of a question, which never happens, um, of course it happens all the time, and instead of there being a large period of silence on the phone, which even five seconds sounds like a large period of silence, right on the screen, you can see the answer to the question that's being asked by the consumer at that moment. And um, that is revolutionizing the way agents are interacting with, with consumers. Then we go to the point where we're, we're dealing with voice bots. And uh, voice bots are, are being used a lot in um, customer service, collections, appointment setting, so many different aspects of uh, business process outsourcing are all being impacted by AI today. Um, we've even gone so far as to actually create a script, uh, a sales script for uh, using an AI. And, and now it's amazing because, oh, well, there's a company out there called Eleven Labs. They've created a new way of listening. You know, I'm not of listening, of speaking, so that it doesn't sound like a, a computerized voice anymore. In fact, it could be my voice. Not that my voice would be worth doing, but any voice could be used. And so what's happening is moving at such a velocity that what may be of interest today to all of us, a year or a year and a half from now, might be the norm. And so I wanted to, you know, talk about that. And, you know, there's this idea out there called cognitive search. And um, cognitive search is, you know, it's, it, com it combines large language models with, um, you know, an external, external knowledge source. And this cognitive search is what is really behind what's going on in, in AI as it looks at, you know, chat GPT or something like that. And, you know, all of us are very, caring very much about content creation, about segmentation marking inning, and about lifetime value. And this cognitive search is, is one of the keys to that. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, quite, it's quite interesting because a lot of us have heard about um, this, this idea of latency and we've heard about hallucinations. And this cognitive search is changing all of that because of the external knowledge that's being combined with the large language model. You see, these large language models are crazy. They, they have so much information in them that somebody asks a question and it may not have the answer. But as soon as you add that external knowledge piece, which for a call center might be a script, might be an audio tape, could be many different things. And with that, you create something 
that takes care of uh, all that and creates a, a better question and answer. And, um, you know, so you have all the benefits that uh, AI is having in our call center and in many call centers. And, um, and, and that's just making stronger brands, make stronger, making stronger customer experience. And um, it, it's, it's really revolutionizing, revolutionizing the call center space. Thanks, Greg. Great, great recap. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things we've been trying to focus on with AI uh, and what we're presenting to our viewers is um, and our followers is uh, outside of that realm of creative. You know, everyone thinks about AI with creative immediately. You think about voice, you think about uh, what the visual looks like. There's so many great things happening in the background. So it's wonderful to hear your, your insights on that. Thank you so much. Um, up next, we are going to welcome Paul Mosenson, founder of New Spark Media Group, a member of the PDMI Workshop Council. Paul, welcome in. Hey, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right, good. I've, uh, I have to go to like a, another office because of power. So anyway, that's good. So hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be a visionary here, and I appreciate Greg with the AI. I'm very much into it. And since this is about e-commerce and performance TV and things like that, how do you blend the two? right and so what i've been thinking about and more of a visionary which is something that can come is basically looking at consumer behavior first right when you talk about e-commerce unless you're on amazon search or google shopping and things like that you're um you know that's a, like a what we call like a bottom funnel they're actually looking for something all other media like facebook and all that you know it's hard to get people to say let's find out Let's find out, right? Um, you know, because again, you know, you're putting brand things like that. But um, but we want to do is what direct response is is all about direct response, right? And that's the history of uh, like television, right? Is um, pick up the phone and do it now, right? But you know, most people aren't ready yet. You know, they're not. So what I was thinking about with um, making TV work again, you know, or better is the concept of AI. And, and just think about this being open-minded about um, maybe people just need to learn. It's almost like taking B2B lead generation in the B2C where maybe people aren't ready to buy that vacation trip, but I like to learn what's there and anything for my family, right? So perhaps, you know, in the e-commerce direct response space, especially when you have an offer that may not be buy now, but it might be get a guide, download something to make a decision, okay? It could, it could cover anything of your e-commerce and, and maybe it is um, the guide to interior design in your apartment or whatever it is. And you can, with AI, you can build this content easily and you could build um, landing pages and follow up messages all with AI. And the beauty is because of the speed, you can target different audiences. So if you are doing travel for the sake of conversation and you want to target 45 plus, it's fine, but maybe you want to target 25 to 34 with a different message. But now we don't have to go crazy doing all that production. Now we can just build the tools with the, not just the AI content, but AI video, and as Greg mentioned, you know, Lev Labs and all these other tools to test, right? So we're not, you know, testing makes, AI makes testing a lot easier because you don't feel like you're spending a whole lot of money for, you know, a two or three week test, right? You can try, I mean, that's just, you know, saying that, but the point though is there's lots of ways you can do it. You know, getting back to the TV component is, you know, the QR codes, right? You know, or, I know Roku just came out with something called action ads. You know, every you know they're all trying to get the remote and say, let's do something now. Um, but you know, I may not be ready yet, right? Most people aren't. But if, if you want to get people into what we call a funnel, what's a B two B word, <laughs> um, and send them text offers and email messaging with promo codes and all those things, and maybe the concept is to uh, use AI to um, educate people about what they may want to learn about weight loss or about fitness centers and about here's some great exercises you're building trust and you know no matter what business you're in b2b or b2c it's still about trust and and the best way to, to build trust is to you know offer educational content that uh, intrigues me to learn more and then become a customer later on so 
that's something to think about, you know, down the road when you do want to, the next time some OTT salesman comes up and says, oh, well, you know, you've got a great view rate or something. I say, BS. That doesn't mean anything. Oh, look, there's a tool that shows me how many people visited my site, but they didn't convert. doesn't matter, right? They were just intrigued what that was. But if you can capture people in your funnel, in your CRM, and send them either text or email messages about, hey, for downloading a guide, hey, we have a great special deal for you. Here's a promo code. Well, that's direct response, right? Um, but you're getting more people interested in the topic because they're not ready to buy yet, but they're interested, intrigued with the message. So that's my thought for the day of, of like maybe a new way to use CTV or OTT, those kind of things, um, and have some real names coming in versus um, all these other algorithms out there and pixels and say, well, maybe, but maybe not. So anyway, that's my uh, thought for today. Thanks, Paul. Uh, good stuff. You know, I think with any, as with anything, um, as you see opportunities to test and look at look at this and 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 try and give it a shot, uh, it's always. I mean, this is what we do in this space, right? We test, we test things and find out if they work. Um, again, thank you, Paul. Thanks for being here. Next up, uh, Greg Silvano, CEO of Mojo, chair of the e-commerce council. Greg, um, you're going to round out our AI centric portion of the chat. Oh, on mute. <laughs> I thought I clicked it too. Sorry, the Gregs are all starting off on mute. Sorry about that. I'm going to correct you though. It's biased. We rebranded, not Mojo. All good. Where, I where did I pick that up? Where did 12 I pick up? Years, you picked it up from 12 years of Mojo. That's what you picked it up. I from. Just, I mean, my God. Okay. Greg Savano, i biased. He Thank is. you very much. Uh, so I'm not going to preach about artificial intelligence because I think there's a, a better way to get the point across, and that is with an example, a real-world example. So we are all in the direct response industry, which means at one point, certainly it, at the latest in 2024, we have either been asked the question or have asked the question, our sales went down last week, why? Right? It's inevitable. And the problem is that it's a, in e-commerce, it's a very complicated question because e-commerce is really complicated. It's actually way too complicated. And you know the reality is your e-commerce site is probably held together by software developers, duct tape, and a prayer, right? There's just a bunch of different apps, a bunch of different things happening. So to get to the root of that question is really difficult to do. Today, if you asked us, and we get this question all the time, but if you asked us that question, there would be a laundry list of things that we would go through to determine if there's really a problem, right? So, you know, why did your sales go down last week? And I'm going to go through some of these just to kind of expand on why this is uh, so complicated. So if you came to us today and said, hey, our sales went down last week, why? First thing we would do is determine, is there really a problem? Maybe your sales didn't go down. Maybe last week was abnormally high, right? It might have been seasonality or promotion or a holiday. So this week is low compared to last week, but it's not actually a problem. Then we'd run a test order, right? Do we see any problems as we go through the checkout? We would look at some technical stuff. Maybe you have a bunch of different domains and one of those domains expired. So you had some Facebook ad that was running and, and that's going to a, a domain that doesn't work. So that's why your sales went down. They can go to zero, but just went down. Then we start to look at all your credit card transactions. You know, Maybe you have more declines than normal, right? So that could be something like your payment processor stopped accepting Amex. So again, not that everything went down, but just Amex sales went down because uh, they couldn't order. Then, of course, we'd have to look at PayPal Express and Buy Now, Pay Later. We'd have to look at Apple Pay. If any single one of those were down, your sales would go down. So it gets complicated. We'd have to look at your abandoned orders. Are you running any A-B tests? Most importantly, we would look, are there any changes to the site that were made in this time frame? You know, maybe you had an employee that went in and got rid of a promo code. They changed the pricing of a product or the, the whole design of the site. Uh, maybe that was the cause of the, the sales going down. And then finally, last piece, is we'd have to look at every single piece of traffic coming in, every original source of traffic, because maybe everything looks great from Google and YouTube and everything looks great from Facebook, but on TikTok, you're down $2,500 in sales from the week before. So that gives you that path of why did that happen? So you get my point. E-commerce is complicated. Asking a, a seemingly normal business question is very complicated to do. So, oh, and by the way, it gets worse than that because you can't just take a number. You can't say, oh, my abandons are 42. That's meaningless. You have to look at the trends of abandons over time. So it takes time to go through all this. So where does artificial intelligence come in uh, to play here? 
we have, and I'll use our example, we have a version of BIAS called BIAS Pro. It's powered by artificial intelligence. And when posed with that exact question, you get the answer in 45 seconds. So it's not just saying, oh, go look here, download this report, look at these, look at these changes, go through the audit log. It's not telling you to do all those things. It already did it. So in 45 seconds, it went through everything and it doesn't give you this big, huge report. It gives you your answer. You asked why sales went down and it will come back and say, because you got rid of the number one promo code that has been the biggest factor in your sales of the past four weeks. Um, so, and you get that in your own language, right? You didn't have to learn report names, oh, download the transactions report or the abandoned reports. You actually don't even know, need to know those things exist at all, which is a huge leap forward when you're dealing with e-commerce. Again, e-commerce is complicated. So the reason I'm excited about artificial intelligence is that it takes the complication of e-commerce and reduces it down to you ask questions and you do your job and it helps you do that without you being forced to learn everything about e-commerce and the 50 things you have to know in order to sell your very first product and but wait there's more 45 seconds okay so all that stuff in 45 seconds that was true up until two weeks ago two weeks ago open ai released their latest ai model called 4o the letter o for omni that response now comes back in 10 seconds. So faster than somebody, if they had the answer ready for you and they simply had to move to another screen, copy it and paste it and hit go, you actually got the response with the right answer to your problem. And this is just, it's one of a thousand things that AI can do when it is given that information. And that's the key. And this actually goes to what Greg was saying earlier. I'm sorry, no, uh, yeah, it was Greg. Um, I forget the deep search that you were talking about where it hallucinates less, um, but that's what starts to happen. When AI is given the kind of information that is, is necessary for e-commerce, you cannot do it faster. It's impossible. You cannot keep up with how efficient and how fast AI gets you the answers and the results that you need to be able to do your job. So I'm either excited or terrified. It's one of the two. <laughs> Can you ask AI if you're excited or terrified? Yeah, actually, uh, it's funny. <laughs> We've I ask questions all the time. So uh, I'll show the extreme here. By the way, when I say in your language, you can literally ask the question in Portuguese, Greek, Italian, Swedish, doesn't matter. You'll get it back in your language, right? No additional code on our side. Um, the the talking about um, it was either Greg or Paul that said the the how quickly things were evolving in AI. So when we started Bias Pro last year, we used 3.5 OpenAI. Then we switched to 4.5 Turbo, which is their model. And this latest one, 4.0, it comes back in a fraction of the time. A better answer, it's half the cost. I mean, it's the, the leaps forward are off the charts and it's just getting started. I mean, it's it can't emphasize how much this is going to impact e-commerce. Awesome. Thanks, Greg. Um, takeaways here, the Greg's like AI, and so does Paul. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I, I do, uh, we've had an AI question pop in, and I'm going to ask it at the end, but uh, we'll let you guys fight it out over that question at the end, or maybe you won't want to. Um, up next, we're going to pass the hot potato to Kaylin Wiedelman, an associate at Venable LLP, which is a key firm in the PDMI's Government Affairs Council. Kaylin, what do you have your eye on right now? Thank you, Thomas. Well, as an advertising and consumer protection attorney, I think it's only natural that green claims are on my mind. Um, so I'll touch briefly on the exciting world of green advertising. Um, as you all may know, consumers are getting more and more interested in purchasing products that advertise that the product can make a positive impact on the environment or is less damaging to the environment. In a survey conducted by PwC last year, February 2023, more than 70% of respondents said that they were willing to pay more for sustainably produced goods to some or to a great extent. So this increased importance of green benefits to a product means that these types of claims are the top of mind for federal and state regulators. For example, the Federal Trade Commission announced that it will be issuing a revised set of green guides, which gives us insight into what the commission expects for green claims in terms of substantiation, such as that a product is recyclable or that a product is biodegradable. 
And while we wait for these new green guides, um, businesses are having to carefully navigate marketing products with these green claims. So how do we do this? Um, well, we typically rely on the litigation landscape, so class actions or state AG, um, attorney general opinions, um, FTC actions, to give us a sense of what the guardrails should be um, when we're advising on substantiating or promoting certain um, green claims. So um, just really quickly, I'll mention a couple of ongoing class actions that we're watching. Um, one is an ongoing class action alleging that a company's toothpaste tube is deceptively marketed as recyclable. Um, plaintiffs allege that the recycling facilities are actually unable to distinguish from the recyclable tubes from the non-recyclable tubes. So the facilities are just rejecting the tubes wholesale. So therefore, it makes the tubes unable to be recycled at all. And in another class action, plaintiffs are alleging that the supply chain relies on child slave labor and causes environmental degradation, despite the company advertising that its cocoa supply chain is sustainably and ethically sourced. So the common thread here is that green claims are a lightning rod for litigation. So while making green claims can be a powerful tool for advertising and marketing, um, I recommend evaluating claims very carefully to ensure that they are appropriately qualified and substantiated. So that's my hot potato for today. <laughs> Thanks, Thomas. Absolutely. Thank you, Kaylin. It's interesting that, you know, there is so much excitement around being able to make green claims and environmental claims about your products and and um you know we see it we see it all the time so good reminder to have your ducks in a row um because there is an active active class action here uh zone out there just like there is kind of with anything else but uh, this one particularly with how, how, how hot the space is so thanks again another expert from our women's leadership council is ava Seavey. she's founder president of Agilance creative services ava your turn Hi, everybody. Uh, a lot of you know me. I'm 100 years old, but I look so young because I use my clients' products. But I have very rarely been this excited. Oh, and my assistant blew out my cat, who may or may not uh, help me out with this presentation because I can't stop her from <laughs> honing in on, on, the, on the territory here. Um, so because I'm 100 years old and I've been in this industry for so many years, I've rarely been as excited as I am about my two. So you buy one, get one free today. Two hot potato topics. The first one is TikTok. And what has changed dramatically with TikTok? I know a lot of the DR marketers are terrified of TikTok because they think it's new, it doesn't have attribution. Guess what, guys? There's a billion users. And according to Morning Consult, 49% of people that view something on TikTok make a purchasing decision. 49%, that's pretty big. Also, 53% of the people on TikTok are over 40. And guess what? 31.3% are over 40. So stick that into your craw because TikTok is not just for teenagers, and it's not just people dancing. It's a lot of educating, the way some of the others have spoken about educating consumers. And P.S., it's a third the click of Facebook, and the CPMs are far lower than on many other platforms. However, uh, TikTok had a very jiggy attribution up until TikTok Shop. TikTok Shop is so freaking exciting that I can barely stand it, okay? So th think of it almost like an Amazon on TikTok. You can set up a TikTok shop for free. You can place your products there for free. And now, up until July, TikTok has a very where we're talking your sales, 2% goes to TikTok, 2% plus a 30 cent transaction fee. Hello, compare that to what you're spending on Amazon or other places. And as Google declines more and more and more, which we know that it is, and as Facebook gets harder and harder, um, TikTok is now another huge platform because of TikTok shop. And guess what? The people that are on TikTok can stay on TikTok. They don't have to go someplace else. 
Yes, they can go to Greg's bias site from TikTok and buy there. Yes, they can go to Amazon and buy there. But guess what? They can stay right on TikTok and buy right in your TikTok store. And the last thing I'll say about TikTok is an ad driven by TikTok to the TikTok store is going to convert 73%. You heard that right. 73% higher than on another platform. So I don't know what people are afraid about with TikTok now that there's a TikTok store. Are they saying ban? I'm sorry, I thought that was a deodorant. I don't believe there's going to be a ban on TikTok. And if there is, get your tuckuses there now before there is one and take advantage of selling a crap load of product at a very low cost to sell. But don't think you're going to drive those people there with organic. You must take ads out, which are going to get a lot more traffic for you than just doing organic. Organic is great. Don't get me wrong. But you're not going to convert as much through organic. The second hot potato is really as exciting to me, which is CPA streaming. Coming from a brand background, which I did, it's really the combination of everything that was exciting to me about brand and about DR. Um, so yeah, linear is still around as Fern said, it is declining and streaming is increasing, but there was not great ROI with streaming for a lot of the DR people. Well, guess what? There's CPA streaming now. So you can pay for your streaming by negotiating a deal on your percentage of cart, on uh, a buyout for product sale, depending on what the sale is. And exciting for me, because I have a lot of um, lead gen types of clients where they're selling higher ticket items or services, cost per lead, cost per lead. If you know what your cost per lead is in other mediums, you can buy uh, CPA streaming till the cows come home. And it's scalable. This has also been a problem with linear. It's not necessarily scalable. This is exciting. It's scalable. You can create beautiful brand 30 second spots with the CTA and 15s for retargeting. And you can, you can reap the rewards on a very low risk strategy if you negotiate smartly. So those are my two hot potatoes. Thank you. Thank you, Ava. Both great, uh, great things to think about. TikTok, obviously, a huge player. Um, I love your take on the ban and possible and likely lack thereof. Um, great laugh line, the de deodorant. Thank you for that one. I'm going to use that one. Um, and a great turn of the corner into streaming and CTV. Uh, up next, we'll welcome uh, Televisa Univision uh, Kyle Patton. Uh, leader of their DR and performance team there, and a member of the U.S. Hispanic Council. And Kyle, take it away. No, thank you, guys. That was, uh, so far, the hot potato takes have been really interesting. I'm, I'm almost terrified what Greg knows about my credit history and my credit card bills, so that was a bit alarming to hear that, but very insightful. Uh, the thing I want to kind of just touch on today, and it's been so prevalent in our marketplace, it's the fast channels, the free ad supported television. Uh, for all you that don't know, heard about it, it's you know it's free ad supported television in a form of streaming that's either programmed similar to cable, satellite, or traditional TV. You might have seen it. It's most prevalent on Rook, uh, Tubi, Roku, and Freebie for Amazon. But the thing that has been what I've seen the biggest change is just how effective it is at such a low cost. CPM. You have a single digit CPM that most publishers are going out at and it's doing effectively well. It doesn't even need to do, you don't even need to do programmatic because it already does such a good job. You don't even need to do targeting. And it's it really kind of it's where I think our business is going. And to kind of go down the, the streaming aspect, I think you're seeing a lot of these companies just losing money constantly in streaming. Not to say that linear is going to become roaring back. I just don't think linear is going away to Fern's point. But if you look at last week or last two weeks of the upfronts, it was pretty much dominated by tech. Amazon and Netflix, uh, they're, they're going to be 
putting a lot of money, taking a lot of money out of the market. And, you know, they're not spending as much on streaming and they're not spending as much on content. You see Warner Brothers is passing on the NBA most likely. And I think that we're going to see more of the bundle is people are going to need the bundle to survive. They're not, they're sick of paying over $200 for streaming services. You have the Netflix now getting into the NFL. They spend $150 million on games. And the thing that blows me away is that YouTube TV, uh, it makes $50 billion a year and they don't spend any money on content, yet they have over 10% of the Nielsen impressions. So I do think we're starting to see a shift in our business. I don't think linear is going away, but I do think fast channels are going to be the future and they're doing very well, and especially as they continue to scale. As they continue to scale, the CPM will be cheaper. The cheaper the CPM, the more efficient it will be for some of our brands and advertisers. So that is my hot potato take. And that's all I got. Love it, Kyle. Thank you so much. Fast Channels has been getting a lot of buzz on our on our webinars and on our stage in Miami. Um, it's interesting to see even some of the media agencies creating uh, teaming up with groups to create Fast Channels of their own. Um, it definitely seems like there's a wave there. So thanks for your take there. Um, we're going to wrap this up and uh, kind of look ahead still into the CTV realm, but bring it full circle. Maybe when we're talking about the audience, back to the kind of the audience that Fern was talking about. Carrie Chase, Senior Vice President of Media at Modus Direct and a member of the Brand Response and Women's Leadership Councils is here. Carrie, your turn. All right, thank you so much. And yes, it, I kind of get to check off everybody's boxes here because it starts with Fern with, we don't believe that linear is dead. However, CTV is definitely something that we need to be very aware of and cognizant of. And um, as an agency, we do a majority of our marketing um, for products that are geared toward the adult 65 plus um, demographic. And that has always been a bit of a slippery slope when you're using, trying to use new technology like CTV. We've been active in the CTV space for over 10 years. We really wanted to test. As we've been talking about, we always, as Tom said, we our DR marketers at heart, and we constantly want to test. Um, we've seen moderate growth um, in that area, but we expect it, and we're really excited and anticipate this to kind of skyrocket. Um, to kind of give a sense, um, there's really two factors at play. I think that the older demographic, you know, they kind of, it's, it's changing. Um, we're seeing the baby boomer, if you will, um, that 65 plus is turning into what is called Generation Jones, which is essentially um, people that are born from 1960 to 1965, getting into that 65, unfortunately, <laughs> um, area demographic, and they are much more savvy. You think about Barack Obama, you think about Madonna, those are people that really didn't live through World War II and kind of holding on to technology, they, this is the generation that essentially discovered browsers and really were the um, forefront runners of the internet. Uh, so we see that those people have been using the technology for the last 25 years, much more comfortable with it. We have seen um, at MODIS, our budgets increase year over year, about 10%. 10 to 15 percent and we anticipate that to increase significantly because we do think it's going to go exponentially just as an example in 2012 only 13 percent of people that were 65 plus had smartphones in 2021 that was over 61 percent and i think that that's probably been even surface charged more by um, covid so we want to make sure that we are really tying into knowing exactly what works. And this kind of goes into what Kyle was mentioning with fast channels, all those areas of CTV, it's not just CTV and OTT, you kind of have to have all these different acronyms at the end of it. And once you understand and you've played in that space, I think it's really important to know what the right recipe is. Because from a media standpoint, it's always about not just jumping in, but it's the testing, it's knowing which players are right, it's knowing what works for your particular client. We work with clients, and this is not only on the national side, but it's also on the local side. And it's really being able to put all the pieces together, and we're really excited that this upcoming AEP will probably have you know, 15 to 20% of our budgets dedicated to these new technologies. Still though, you know, to a tip of the hat to Fern said, um, it's you know, linear is still a big part of it, but it is evolving. And um, even what Ava had said, the 
you know, the, the percentages are just increasing exponentially as the older demographic gets much more savvy. And that kind of hits everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. Uh, way to round it out. We appreciate it. Um, great, great thoughts, everybody. Uh, really good stuff. We got a few questions here. Um, so we will uh, we'll run through these uh, and see uh, see where we uh, pan out here in the next uh, eight or nine minutes. Um, first one that came in, any tips for taking advantage of the new YouTube shopping? Is anyone thinking that this will increase the number of live events? And uh, I'm going to go with Mary, you, Marianne, since you talked, spoke about YouTube. You know, um, yes, it's early days. And so I would say um, they also are only currently integrated with a handful of e-commerce platforms, not including Greg's at the moment. Hope to get him there. But um, yeah, so absolutely get on there and give it a try. And I don't think it can hurt. Um, attribution is absolutely the Achilles heel right now of of youtube but there there are some youtube shop there's obviously utm coded links there's becoming a partner status there's things that that you can do so yes absolutely great thanks marianne um this one is, uh, goes uh, most likely to greg sarnow um consumer acceptance of voice bots are consumers reacting positively to this um do you know if disclosures need, need to be made uh, to let consumers know they're speaking to a voice bot? How are consumers reacting, Greg? You're on mute. <laughs> Depends on how you're using it. Um, in places where um, you're using it for like uh, sales, it's a little too complex. Um, where places in customer service, it's been used for a long time in a different way with a, you know, with a, um, you know a data dump and uh, you know where you go in you know, with an IVR and do a data dump it's not all that much different except there's a little more conversational part of it so it is acceptable and it is it has a good acceptance um, for collections it works very well um, so it it just depends on which part of the um, of the service that you're giving that you know it has more acceptance on my goal when I started it was to think, oh, it'd be great for sales um, because it really has an impact on, um, you know, think about it. Instead of an IVR, you have a conversational IVR. You think mm -hmm. of it, you have a wrap up on the call. So therefore, as a result of that, you have less chargebacks. You have, um, you know, which, you know, is a critical in our world. And, um, you know, so there were a lot of advantages, but unless the, if the script gets to with upsells and downsells and cross sells, it gets a little too much. So, you know, it has to be a little, a little tighter than, than just a, a very, very long script. Got it. Got it. Thanks. Um, another AI question. Um, the Google search AI debuted over the last, I want to say like week or so. And it's debuted with a lot of public errors. Um, I saw one last night where uh, somebody was like, "Hey, I asked if uh, if anyone knows who Ren and Stimpy are. Ren and Stimpy, the old Nickelodeon <laughs> slash MTV cartoon from uh, so when I was in my early twenties. Somebody asked if Ren and Stimpy were Bible characters and uh, were appeared in the Bible and got a positive affirmation from Google's AI that Ren and Stimpy were in fact in the Bible. So." We talked a lot about test and improve, but maybe not so publicly. Where, uh, Greg Silvana, where do you think uh, uh, Google's going to go from here on this? I have uh, I have a very strong opinion on this. <laughs> AI today in 2024 is already good enough. It's good enough. Stop trying to trick it. Stop trying to make it perfect. If I called up anybody, first level tech support of any company and got a person and I said, is Ren and Stimpy in the Bible? I'll get some wrong answers, right? It's just, you can trick people, you can trick AI. The question is, as business people, is AI good enough for me to do my job faster, better, safer than I could without it? Not, can I trick it? I can trick anything. I can trick people all day long. It's not hard to do, right? It's, it, I'm getting you fired up. It, it, when you use it and you use it correctly as a, as a consumer of AI, um, 
does it give you an answer better than you could get anywhere else in that moment? And the answer almost every single time is yes. I, I go to ChatGPT and I ask it questions that I would have gone to Google a while ago. Um, why? Because I don't feel like sorting through a bunch of crap links and spam and things like that, a bunch of ads, when I simply just want to know X, right? Give me the answer. So it is great for that. And as business users, I think that's important, right? It, it does our jobs. It could do it. And it's it's good enough today. It'll be better next year. It'll be better the year after that. And that's good. You know, can I that'd add something good. here real quick to that? Yeah, let me, let me just add one line. These are bait yeah. click problems, uh, clickbait problems, right? These are things right. because they know people are going to jump all over it because everybody's a little confused or a little bit worried about AI. So if they can do these things, they, they know they're going to have a hot article. That's why this is always in the news. Just to add on to his comment, did anybody hear that um, uh, Sarando, the guy from Netflix, the interview on the interview of the podcast this last weekend? Anyway, he said AI is not going to take your job away. AI, it, the guy who knows how to use AI better, is going to yeah. take your job away. Yeah, and I think that's I think that's the takeaway. I couldn't agree with Greg more. That's great. All right. Um, Time for maybe one or two more. Uh, we'll go with another AI one. Um, and I'm going to tighten up the time frame on the question that came in. Obviously, it's making e-commerce and performance marketing more effective and efficient. Anyone like to speculate where AI will take their business in the next 12 to 18 months? The question was two to three years, but I feel like that's way, way up there for how fast this is moving. Paul, okay, well, maybe I'll go to you first since you stand. I you have to put AI. I can say to that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Greg, key, key is word here would be large language models. Um, large language models right now are these in giant containers with a billion zillion different pieces of information. What you're going to see that's going to happen is they're going to become dedicated to industries, pharmaceutical industry, um, insurance industry. And when that happens, when all these dedicated large language models come into space, going to change the whole game yet another time and make this so much better than it is now. And uh, yeah. Paul, thought, any thoughts on your end on that question? Oh, I'll unmute you. I was going to say, Tom, didn't Elon Musk, doesn't he have an AI competitor now, that XAI that he just launched and just raised, I think it was like $6 billion to compete yeah. against? Yeah. I mean, so I think and if Musk is getting into it, yeah, I think you know this is a hot button topic. Yeah, absolutely. Paul. So um, yeah, here I am. So the question again was. Where is it going to take? Uh, where's your business going to be with AI in 12 to 18 months? Well, again, we're talking uh, e-commerce here, right? So, you know, like, there's so many uh, new tools out there to test creative, to test ads, to test offers, to test um, voiceovers and videos, and so I think. Um, at the end of the day, no matter what you're doing, you're trying to grab people's attention to possibly buy something or sign up for something. Uh, but it does allow you to, you know, whether it's guides I mentioned or other offers to do tests a lot, in a lot quicker and doing creative a lot quicker and see if something works. Of course, they got to give time enough data. But, um, but it is um, something that can help as long as you have enough data to make some business decisions on um, but it does allow you to test. Does 25% off or $25 off work better? Depends on where you advertise that. You've got to keep a lot of things the same. But that's just an example of uh, using the tools to, to test different offers for different audiences and just you know, just have enough scale to make a decision on it. So that's all I can say. Oh, great. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're about out of time here. I want to say thank you to this entire group for uh, getting out there putting themselves on the line, uh, uh, going out on the limb, however you want to say it, um, sharing what they're excited about. Uh, we look forward to hearing back from you guys again, maybe again on this topic next year. It uh, could be something that would be interesting to revisit as we look forward in the future. So again, thanks for, uh, on behalf of our e-commerce council to everybody who took part today. And thank you to the e-commerce council for bringing the event. If you're a PDMI member, PDMI member would like to get involved, you can reach out to me directly today to share your interest in any one of our seven member councils. 
Your next opportunity to attend a PDMI event live online is tomorrow, May 29th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, when the Brand Response Council airs its latest episode of Take 20, a look at consumer response to AI in performance marketing. To register, please visit the pdmi.com slash take-20. Finally, online registration is moving along for PDMI West, October 7th through 9th at Hard Rock Hotel San Diego. Our early bird special pricing on badges for performance marketers must attend event of the fall. Our price is just $295 for PDMI members and $495 for non-members through June 14th only. Our specially priced hotel room block for the show is available now for badge holders only. Prices on badges will go up by $100 on June 15th, so get in now. Visit the pdmi.com slash pdmi-west to get your badge and to get your discounted hotel room today. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you to our whole team here. Be well. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.